Good morning and hello and welcome to the fiscal year 2025 assessment revolving loan fund and cleanup grant competition for brownfields. We are recording today's session, so I want to give you that alert up front because we are going to post this webinar as well as the slides for today on our website. Before we get started, I want to thank Tara Vaughn, the Region 7 coordinator for this year's competition, and I, Dallas Schaefer, who are assisting with today's call and with the preparation for today. I also want to note if you have any technical difficulties during the call, you, or you get dropped, drop a note into the chat or call Tara directly at the phone number she is going to put into the chat now. So why are we here? By now, I hope you have visited or participated in the headquarters, the EPA headquarters webinars for this year's competition. Region 7 is holding a series of webinars to strengthen each applicant's understanding of the types of grants included in the competition. So you make sure you are applying for the right type for your community, the resources available to help you, as well as changes to the competition from previous years. I want to remind you that the process for I will remind you some of the process for submitting comp competition applications and the competition schedule. But before we go there, I want to let you know there are separate guidelines for each type of Brownfields grant that is being offered this year. There is no substitution, none at all, for reading the guidelines from front to back. There is information you will need to help be prepared and competitive in the application. So always, always please read the guidelines. I'm going to take myself off of the camera now to make sure that we have a clean transmission. And I would also remind you to keep your phone on mute um, until we get to the question section. If you have any questions in the interim, please drop them in the chat. So the webinar agenda for today is this quick introduction. I'm also going to go over a little bit about the format of the slides so that you'll have an understanding that. I'm going to review again the types of grants available and also the amounts of funding that are available. I will talk about some key guideline and policy changes since the previous competitions and a little bit again about application submittal and reminders. The evaluation criteria for the assessment and cleanup grants and the RLF applications will be discussed in our next two webinars. I want to invite you to participate in those two webinars so that we can help you think like a reviewer as you prepare your application. But before going there, again, I hope you have visited the website for headquarters EPA Brownfields program because they have posted several key recordings and information for you, many, many resources. At minimum, you need to attend and or record, view the recording or review the slides at least of the type of grant application you are submitting. So this will go over some of the key section three of the guidelines information about threshold requirements and who's eligible to apply. I highly recommend you review those recordings before you get too far into your grant application. If you are have questions on your eligibility for the grant or your responses to the threshold criteria, those should be submitted to Tara, our regional competition contact, as soon as possible. We cannot meet with you to discuss your specific applications, but we can help you understand whether or not you can meet those threshold requirements. In addition to the threshold and the minimum requirements for these applications, Headquarters has also posted two webinars they held, uh, one for assessment and cleanup. No, I got that wrong. One for assessment, the three types of assessment, and one for cleanup and revolving loan fund. Those recordings are available online and go into much greater detail than I will today about the application requirements and what you need to submit. There are also slides available on that site. I always like to have a commonly used acronym slide in here because it is alphabet soup. Oops, that did not go. Alphabet soup, 
when it comes to using acronyms. We are the government. We tend to acronym, put long names on things and then create a lot of our acronyms. I will try to define my terms as I go, but if you come back and review this video or you look at the slides, this is always available to you. Again, I wanted to give you a few, little bit more information about the slides because I hope this will serve as a reference for you, again, as you are preparing your application. There is pink or magenta text highlights, and those show information that is new or revised for this year's competition. There's some orange text, which is gonna emphasize important points, red text, always read the red text. Um, and on each slide, there is a color coded tab or multiple tabs that will tell you which type of application that slide is relevant to. And again, I hope you can use this as a future reference as you're preparing your application. There are also some color coded boxes. Yellow boxes are just tips and reminders and clarifications and side suggestions. Red boxes, always look at the red, are your warnings. Um, there's links and information to references in the orange boxes and the orange and the orange ribbons. They will provide some useful links. We will also be dropping those in the chat as we move forward. So quick progress check. We've all gone through the introduction and the agenda, and I see some additional people have joined us. Thank you for ahead, being Ruth. with us. Yep. Being with us today. Um, Brian, we've asked everybody to stay on mute until we get to the question section. But thank you for being here. The next thing I'm going to walk through is the types of grants that are available this year and the relevant funding amounts. EPA has issued separate NOFAs, Notices of Opportunity for Funding, or RFAs, if you will, Requests for Funding, in a separate document for each type of grant, as I mentioned earlier. There are four types, if you will, of assessment grants, assessments for states and tribes only, assessments for coalitions, assessments for newer, whoops, that didn't work, newer grantees and uh, existing grantees. We also will have RLF, Revolving Loan Fund Grants, and I'll talk about that briefly, and cleanup grants available at three tiers. So who's eligible for these grants? I'm not going to dwell a long time on this slide because again, we would like you to go back and review those slides that headquarters, EPA headquarters has posted regarding the uh, minimum requirements for applying for a grant. But in general, a unit of government or a quasi unit of a government, a tribe or a 501c3, IRS 501c3 nonprofit are eligible for these grants. The cleanup for cleanup only, and this is the cleanup only, there is a, another section of the IRS code, a, a C code that makes you available. That should have been 40. I don't know that that reference is right. Um, uh, so anyway, for cleanup slides, for cleanup only, if you are a 501c3, then you are eligible to apply. So we highly encourage nonprofits to apply for these grants where that will be something that is key to helping their community. There's a full list of eligible entities and a lot more description, both in the slides from the webinar headquarters put on and also from in the guidelines in section 3A of the guidelines. And as I said earlier, there, there's no substitute for reading the guidelines. There are also two helpful charts available online on who is eligible to apply. One is for if you have a, a Brownfields grant already, and the other is if you are interested in applying for multiple applications. We've dropped the link in the chat for this, and Any site-specific questions for cleanup grant on eligibility, again, please reach out to us um, through Terra so that we can help answer those before you submit your application. I did wanna give you the reference for these slides because I think they will help you understand what's available. So as I mentioned earlier, for assessment, a Brownfields assessment, we have four types of applications. 
The first type is the assessment for community-wide assessment for states or tribes. This is only for tribes and states, and they may receive up to $2 million in a five-year grant to help the communities within their jurisdictions. Assessment coalitions are also available, and those are for a shorter amount of time, and I'll talk a little bit about, about what those are, but there is also a fair amount of money for those grantees, $1.2 million per grant, uh, and we hope to issue 29 of those. We have divided the community-wide assessment, that's what CW stands for, the community-wide assessment into new applicants and existing Brownfield recipients, grant recipients. This is to help level the playing field. We don't want applicants who are new to the Brownfields realm to feel like they have to compete with some of these people who or grantees that have been with us for years. So we divide those into two different lists and you, we select from each of those um, the highest ranked applications to make our awards. I also want to mention there is no cost share this year for any type of grant. Thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure funding, we have the opportunity to, for this year and next year, to offer grants that do not require a funding share. Let's talk a little bit about what these grants are. So, as I mentioned, there's three types of assessment grants, and the community wide grant gets divided into two, but they look at the same criteria and are under the same guidelines. These grants can be used for a variety of activities, including inventory, the brownfield sites in a community, characterizing um, by identifying the past uses and what has happened on that property in the past, environmental assessment, which helps you determine whether there is or is not contamination on site, and also some site-specific cleanup planning and area-wide planning to help you scope and plan for revitalizing your actual sites in the best way to meet the needs of your community. We also highly encourage community engagement at every stage of applying for a grant and implementing a grant because we need you to be aware of your stakeholders needs and use this grant to address them. I mentioned that you can do some planning activities with your assessment grants. I just want to give you a little idea of what that can be um, because it will help you determine the best use. It, it may help you determine the best use for your sites and also to implement a vision you might have for an area within your community. There are specific fact sheets or information sheets available at the link on this slide to walk you through each of these types of planning. These are only eligible under assessment grants. So let's talk a little bit about each type of assessment grant. Community-wide assessment grants, as I mentioned, we're gonna divide those into two lists and they are used for by an eligible entity to address Brownfield's challenges within their community. They can be funded up to $500,000 and are available for up to four years. This year, EPA headquarters has indicated that they will they intend to select a minimum of three quality applications per region. So this is a national competition, and we want to make sure that applicants from each region feel like they have a the equal chance of, of success. And so this year we are looking to select three quality applications from each region. Assessment coalition grants. These are larger grants because they represent a key partnership with a lead member and a non-leader member. The non-lead members should be partners who do not have the ability to apply for a, and manage a EPA cooperative agreement on their own, or they would not otherwise have access to Brownfield's grant resources. Applicants are encouraged, but you're not required, to include eligibility, eligible community-based nonprofits. So this is the difference from last year. We did require that a nonprofit be included as a partner. This year, while highly encouraged, it is not a requirement. You must identify a target area for each member, including the lead member, but also each of the partners. That target area may not overlap between members. 
You must have a minimum of two targeted sites for each of the members within their jurisdiction or geographic boundary that's identified. And again, this is much larger amount of money that is available to each grantee up to $1.2 million per grant. Again, this is designed for one entity who has capacity to implement a Brownfields Agreement to reach out and help others who may not have the capacity but do have needs that need to be met. The lead member of a coalition must be either a governmental entity, a tribal entity, or the Alaska Navy Villages, a regional group, um, like a council, regional group, a regional council of governments, or a group, group of general purpose units of local government established under a governmental authority. So again, you can partner with your neighboring communities, you can partner with your uh, planning organizations um, that have jurisdiction over multiple communities, you can partner with your county. Any of those would be eligible partnerships, but the lead must be one of these entities. Now, non-lead members must have, for a coalition, you must have at least two non-lead members, but no more than four. So when I say at least two, that means there would be three entities involved in the coalition, the lead entity and two non-lead entities. Um, and again, that can go up to four non-leads. You must include at least one member that has never been awarded a Brownfields grant. This is new this year. This has not been a requirement in past uh, competitions. And entities with an open Brownfields multi-purpose assessment, revolving loan fund, or cleanup grant, that's what MARC stands for, can demonstrate that they have drawn down 70% of the funding for each open grant are eligible to be apply as part of a coalition, but not as a lead member. They may be a non-lead member. Members of the coalition may not be an agency or instrumentality of itself. So this is again where I encourage you to reach out if you have questions about the el your eligibility or the eligibility of your non-lead members when it comes to applying for a coalition grant. The last type of community yeah, of assessment grant are the community-wide assessment grants for states and tribes. And I sometimes uh, use the acronym CWAG Street for that. So who can apply for that? Again, it's just these entities identified, the states individually and the tribes. Um, the key features of this is they have to have three target areas and at least five priority sites in the application when each of those target areas must have at least one of those priority sites. They should be targeting areas of higher and lower population densities, and the recipient must assess a minimum of 10 sites in underserved communities throughout the project period. The funding is up to 2 million, and the project period for those is up to five years. So the next type of funding that's available this year are a lot Revolving Loan Fund Grants. The Brownfields Cleanup Revolving Loan Fund Program, or RLF, is a program that is designed to help communities capitalize a loan pool that can be used for cleanup of grants. So these can start out at a million dollars. They have the opportunity to supplement that information, that funding as they go. So again, these grants provide capitalization funding to an eligible recipient to start a, their own cleanup program. Under that program, they will make subgrants or provide loans to eligible entities to carry out cleanups at Brownfields. A successful revolving loan fund program revolves by generating program income, which is then used to make more grants and subgrants. And consistent with the bipartisan infrastructure law, cost sharing and matching funds are not required for the FY25 RLF grant competition. Fiscal year, FY, let's try to find that. Now our funding can go to an eligible individual entity or a coalition of entities. And again, they start out at up to $1 million. Only eligible entities who do not have or are not part of an existing coalition 
so they do not have an open cooperative agreement and they're not part of another open cooperative agreement can apply this year. The reason for that is existing RLF recipients may apply for supplemental funding annually, and that is a non-competitive -com process and a way for them to increase the, their uh, loan capitalization pool. Again, I mentioned these are five years, but high-performing revolving loan fund recipients will get supplemental funding, as I just mentioned, and that grant may be open for up to 15 years. Some grants are limited to 500,000 per site, and entities receiving subgrants must own the subject site throughout the period of performance of the subgrant. So that during the period of cleanup, whoever is provided the funding from the recipient directly as a subgrant must own that property. But borrowers who are making um, borrowing funds for cleanup are not limited per site, nor are they subject to that same requirement of ownership. I want to dwell a little bit on this, and again, we'll talk a bit about this more in our RLF-related webinar, but at least 50% of the total award amount must be used for loans and eligible programmatic costs associated with those loans. Repaid loans are returned into the fund and relent to other borrowers. They may not be used for other purposes. These are designed, as I mentioned, to operate for many years and possibly decades and require long-term resource commitments during the project period and afterwards. A recipient must commit to properly managing the program income that they generate in perpetuity. And there is a link here to a closeout resources if you want to look at that and see what the commitments are. Now, as I mentioned on the previous slide, coalitions are eligible to apply, but that lead entity must have the capacity to administer the revolving loan fund over a long period of time. Um, it is a good way for one entity to help others that are serving similar communities, um, but might not have the capacity to have a, a operate a revolving loan fund. And the last type of funding that I'm gonna walk through a quick overview on is our cleanup grants. This is where EPA provides direct funding to an eligible recipient to actually clean up a brownfield. So while the site-specific assessments and community-wide assessments will help you investigate those um, sites, a cleanup grant will allow you to address any contamination that has discovered there. Again, there's no cost share thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law. And we have divided the cleanups into three tiers for our applicant pools. Those who are applying for up to a $500,000 cleanup, those applying for up to a $2 million cleanup, and those applying for up to a $4 million cleanup. Now we expect that these cleanups can be um, accomplished within a four year time frame. I wanna stop and mention that multi-purpose assessment and cleanup grants aren't being offered this year. And that is because we chose to offer the revolving loan fund grants um, this year. So cleanup grants, as I mentioned, provide the funding for cleaning cleanup activities as site. One of the key things to be aware of is an eligible entity must own the site at the time of application and throughout the cleanup. There's no fund, there is no cost shares I keep mentioning, but also the applicant must identify which of the tiers it is applying for because you will be placed in a pool of applicants and ranked in order of the highest quality applications down um, of other applicants applying for similar amounts of money. Again, the project period is up to four years. Last year, we introduced a uh, requirement that a applicant for a cleanup grant demonstrate that they are that they have I investigated a site sufficiently to be, if you will, ready for cleanup. The way we ask applicants to ensure this, or we require applicants to ensure this, is to ask your state environmental authority or tribal environmental authority to provide a letter that indicates that either whether you are, are not, or are planning to be enrolled in a voluntary cleanup program with that entity and 
that that entity has determined that sufficient investigation is done that you will be able to move forward with the cleanup in a timely way when the grant is awarded. Now, if you have not completed sufficient investigation at this point, you will have till June 15th. And again, that entity has to indicate its understanding that you will have completed that work so that the cleanup may move forward. We did provide a letter template for those letters this year, and you may need to share that with your environmental or tribal authority. And you must start working with them early because that letter has to be with the application. It cannot be submitted separately or later in order for the application to proceed with evaluation. Now, if it's a state or a tribal authority that is proposing a site, they don't need to identify this, but they do need to um, affirm and include a letter, letter that an environment, excuse me, they do not need to provide this letter. But again, these states and tribal authorities will be providing letters to everyone else. Now, if you have a site that has a type of contamination that will not be eligible for a voluntary response program, um, or equivalent oversight program, then that letter from the environmental authority needs to state that. And again, you must have then have an environmental professional certify that you have enough environmental data and characterization of your property to perform the work that is being planned, the cleanup work. So again, this is, I can't encourage you enough to reach out to your contact with your environmental authority as soon as possible so that you will have a letter on time. I want to identify that for assessment grants, you need a different type of letter from the state, and but you only need to get this environmental authority, um, not environmental authority, the letter from the state voluntary response program um, for cleanup that indicates you are ready for cleanup. All right, I have an opportunity now for questions. If, are there any questions that have been submitted in the chat? I went through this awfully fast. If any of the participants online have a question and you wanna raise your hand and unmute yourself, please do so now. Seeing nothing, I'm just gonna charge on forward. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is a little bit more emphasis on some of these changes to the guidelines. The guidelines are very similar year to year, but they may change a little bit. And it's important if you have applied in a previous competition or if you are familiar with the guidelines from a previous com competition that you be aware of those changes so that you may address them in your application. So some of the bigger policy changes this year include the clarification for environmental justice. Under the White House's Justice 40 initiative, there's a definition for a disadvantaged community. We require those disadvantaged communities that you are addressing be identified by the CGES tool, which is the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, or CEJST, that is available through the Justice 40 program. So it's important to identify that that is the tool you need to use to identify the parcels the, that are addressed that are disadvantaged. Disadvantaged communities are also, um, they can be, are also uh, the tribal properties that may be enrolled. I want to mention that you should pay attention to the Section 1 funding opportunity description because there's some definitional footnotes in the guidelines that I hope will clarify what we mean by disadvantaged community. Now, another change this year, and it doesn't really affect your application, but if you are successful, oops, excuse me, if you are successful in receiving a grant from this competition, there is no longer a prohibition on geographic preference being one of the uh, evaluating criterion for contractors. So if you are seeking to hire a environmental professional and in the past you were not able to include as one of your criterion 
a geographic preference for uh, contractors that are within a certain distance from you, that will no longer be effective for any grant that is awarded and any contract that is issued on or after October 1st, 2024. And finally on this slide, I wanna point out that in the ranking criteria and evaluation criteria, there is a section that we ask about how your grant application, if implemented, will advance environmental justice. We've added to that this year that we would like you to explain how you plan to minimize the unintended displacement of residences or businesses among the underserved commun communities. As we've identified, your target areas should include underserved communities, and we want to make sure you're planning ahead so that you are not unintentionally displacing those populations. All right, another big change for this year, and if you've applied in the past, you'll understand this, is we are allowing you to attach a map of your target area and or your priority sites. This is optional. It will be a separate one-page attachment. It doesn't count against your total um, number of pages. And it may not include additional information. So those of you who may kind of be tricky out there and who want to add some statistics or information like that to your map, keep it simple. We want it to show the target areas and or your priority sites. These maps are not going to be evaluated and they're not going to count against your page limit. And you will not be penalized if you don't include a map. So why would you include a map? because it can help your evaluators, those who are reviewing and scoring your applications, to visualize what it is you are describing. It's that old picture is worth a thousand words, but again, you will not be penalized for not having a map, but it might be a nice visual aid for your reviewers. Other changes to talk about, these are specific to assessment coalition grants. As I mentioned earlier, you must have one non-lead member of your coalition that has never been awarded a Brownfields multi-purpose assessment revolving loan fund or cleanup grant. And again, our acronym for that is MARC. Entities that have an open Brownfields MARC grant are eligible to be non-lead coalition members, but must demonstrate that they've drawn 70% of the funding for each of their existing grants. And that's as of October 1st. Applicants may still include eligible community-based nonprofit organizations as non-lead members, but this is no longer required for the narrative response to be evaluated more favorably. Again, for assessment coalition grants, there's a few other things that have changed. The threshold criterion that prevented non-lead members from having an open grant has changed, and it's been replaced by what you see here. You are going to indicate again that there is a non-lead member who has never had a Brownfields grant. And if you have a non-lead coalition member with an open mark grant, you must identify that and provide a demonstration that they have drawn 70% of their awarded funds. And let's talk a little bit about the community-wide assessment grants for states and tribes. Current CWAG Street, or again, community-wide assessment grants for states and tribes, recipients are eligible to apply for new grants. They must demonstrate that they've drawn and dispersed at least 60%. And if you'll notice here, the and is underscored. They must demonstrate that they've drawn at least 60% of their funding and identify that they have, in fact, paid that funding out. Um, and then again, that requirement is by October 1st, tomorrow of 2024. This is reduced from last year's threshold requirement, which was 70%. We have this year and next year of funding available that we are confident in from the uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. And so we wanna make sure that all applicants have an, an opportunity to apply for those funds if it is appropriate. Oh, here's another big change. And this is part of your threshold criteria. Section three of the guidelines discusses the threshold criteria, which are the pass fail criterion that you must pass all of in order to have your application move to a scoring panel. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Brownfield's eligibility, you may be a petroleum, have petroleum sites or you may have hazardous substances sites. 
there's a new option for demonstrating a defense to liability under a hazardous substances. If you are proposing a site or sites that the contamination is based on the building materials, asbestos, lead paint, for example, and that has not been released into the outdoor environment, then we are not requiring you to demonstrate that you have a defense for liability under CERCLA 107, under the Superfund law on Section 107, which talks about who we consider a potentially responsible party for cleanup and who isn't. In this instance, if the site is limited to asbestos or lead paint or other similar building materials, indoor materials, and that building envelope is intact and there's been no release to the environment outside the building, then those sites are now eligible and clearly eligible for a assessment or cleanup cooperative agreement grant. Please contact us if you have any questions about a property you're bringing in and whether that will be eligible under this option. Again, our contact will be Tara Vaughn. Her information is at the end of this presentation. This is just a clearer description of what I just mentioned. Um, in addition to asbestos and lead paint, you may be talking about insulation and floor caulking, uh, window caulking and um, flooring, but you must be able to indicate that there has not been a release to the environment or there is no imminent threat of release to the environment. And again, that means the building envelope must be intact um, in order to use this as your rationale for why you would not be in responsible party or potentially responsible party under the Superfund law, section 107. So that site type of site will be eligible for Brownfield's funding if all the other eligible criteria are met. So this is just one of the criterion that must be met under the threshold section. Again, see section three of each of the guidelines as well as watch those videos or view the slides online um, regarding the minimum requirements for these cooperative agreements. So here's a couple additional changes that have been made across all the grant types. In addition to talking in section, in the evaluation and ranking criteria, in the narrative and ranking criteria for uh, community engagement, under section 2B, we've asked you to under section 2B, we've asked you to provide a list of your um, key partners. And this is not just eligibility. These are not just your partners if you're a coalition, but every applicant is asked to identify the key partners that are going to be necessary and who have committed to working with them to see the project through to completion in a way that benefits the disadvantaged community. We've asked now this year for you to not only identify the entity, but identify the mission of that entity and so that we can see that it clearly aligns with the work you're planning to do. We do provide a sample format table. It's just a suggestion in the guidelines, but this is a new requirement is that you must also provide the information or the mission of those key partners that you are identifying. And in section four of the narrative and ranking criteria, we've also asked that applicants identify in their organizational capacity that they have the capacity to oversee all the grant tasks and activities, as well as carry out all the management, programmatic, administrative, and financial requirements. Um, and this is a new change in the assessment and revolving loan fund competition guidelines, but that chain has not been made in the cleanup. I mentioned earlier that you may provide a map. And again, as I mentioned before, you will not be penalized if you do not, but that is definitely a new change this year. And it does not count towards your page limitations. It will be an attachment to the narrative information sheet that you will complete um, as the cover page for your application. And I've already covered this and I, hopefully I'm not going backwards. Um, that again, as long as the hazardous building materials have not been released to the environment, you will not have to demonstrate a defense to 107 liability. 
Are there any questions in the chat? I see one from Brian that indicate where he has asked, does ownership of a property matter in terms of assessment grants? No, there's no requirement that the eligible applicant or its coalition partners own a property that they are planning to investigate. That is only a requirement for direct cleanup grants from EPA or a cleanup subgrant under a revolving loan fund that's been established by an eligible entity. Are there any other questions? If you would like to unmute yourself or raise your hand if you have a question. Not seeing any, I will move forward. So the last thing I'm gonna walk through are some um, submittal and other reminders about these applications. The evaluation criteria for the RLF grant applications will be discussed in the next two Region 7 webinars. Um, I'll have that up here in a moment. Today, we were just providing a quick overview of the types of applications that you may submit and a little bit about the changes in the guidelines for those of you who are familiar with past guidelines. And again, review the, head, the OBLR, Office of Brownfields and Land Revitalization, keep calling them headquarters, videos that they have posted online for more information on the um, narrative and ranking criteria. But when I mentioned that the next two webinars are gonna focus on <clears throat> the evaluation criteria, this is again where I, I'm going to encourage you as you are writing your application to think like a reviewer, think like those who will be applying a score to your application. In section four of the guidelines, we provide the narrative information you must provide, what you need to tell us about your project, about your brownfields, about your community, about your plans, um, and what you expect the results to be. But how we score that, how we rank your application is provided in the next section as the evaluation criteria, the review evaluation criteria. That is what we'll be focusing again on the next two slides. I mean, on the next two webinars, excuse me. So reminders, I've mentioned previously, if you have an existing grant and you have a threshold amount that you must have drawn down, that drawdown date is tomorrow, October 1st of 2024. If you are planning to submit a cleanup application, again, I wanna call your attention to the threshold criteria because there is a requirement that you must have a community notification about your application and your analysis of brownfield cleanup alternatives, your cleanup plans um, to your public no less than 14 days before you submit your application. So there's no hard date on this other than 14 days before the due date. Um, of November 14th, but keep it in mind, it's it's 14 days before you submit your application. You will need to do community notification. There are several other community engagement requirements. So please review the, <clears throat> the online videos, read the guidelines and uh, pay attention to those to make sure you've met them all. Okay, here's the biggie. Your applications will be due no later than 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. Keep that in mind. It's November 14th and it's Eastern Time. Do not wait till 11.55 p.m. Eastern Time to submit your application. Your application should be submitted as soon as you are ready. Um, and I highly recommend that you do it a few days before this deadline to make sure that any issues with your application submittal can be resolved. I've had, um, I'm familiar with applicants who have had two different applications they were trying to submit. One went through and the other, it had clicked over 1159 and they were unable to submit it that year. So again, look at it a little earlier um, as you're planning out your schedule for preparing your application and getting it submitted. So what happens after your submittal? Well, in the period of time um, between the submittal until a, mm, middle of May, we conduct our um, competitive review. We receive uh, several hundred applications each year and we put it through an evaluation process so that we can make sure that we are fairly ranking 
each application um, and in our selection that we have leveled the playing field as much as possible. So that can take all the way through mid-May. At that point, we will have a national announcement of who's been selected to receive a grant, but that doesn't mean your work is over. At that point, we will be turning to those who are selected to prepare work plans that formally address what they will be doing with the funding and what they expect to accomplish. Much of that information will already be in your application, but we're gonna put it in a new format. And your any additional grant paperwork that is required will have to be finalized. Generally, you will have your funds and be ready to start your work by October 2025. Uh, a lot of our awards go out in August and September. It's when you might officially get your funds um, if you're selected to receive them. And most start dates are around October 1st of the that year. So this in this instance, it would be October 1st of 2025. So it does take quite a while to get um, through the whole review process. Now, I would like to um, mention a little bit about how you apply. If you're unaware, you need to have an active www.sam.gov, we call that sam.gov, account that is active through November 14th. It must be active on that date, November 14th, um, in order, and it must match the information that you are providing in your application. So this is something you wanna check now, honestly, um, to make sure your organization's account hasn't expired or isn't set to expire um, by November 14th. It can take several days and sometimes a couple of weeks um, to get that updated if it has expired. So start now to make sure that you aren't in a processing status on the date you are trying to submit your application. We now um, require that you submit a universal entity identifier. Again, you're going to get that on www.sam.gov um, and use that on all your applications. Be sure that the UEI matches the entity who is submitting the application. It doesn't belong to a different organization or department or instrumentality of your application, of the recipient. Then what happens is you will submit your application through grants.gov. And in that application, you want to make sure you're using the same UEI that you had identified for your organization in SAM.gov. Now, who can submit the application? Who actually pushes the send button? That is your designated authorized organization representative, or AOR. There is usually one designated AOR in your organization, and you make to make sure that they are available on the date you need that application submitted so that they can um, sign that application electronically. What goes in your application? Again, the guidelines provides this in quite a bit of detail, but you will be submitting a SF standard form 424, which is the overarching application document. You'll be submitting um, a couple of other standard forms and your key contacts where you will identify who your um, project director and your financial people are. And then you will be providing a project narrative. And that's the information that you will have a page limitation on. You will have three pieces to it. There will be a narrative information sheet that can be, I think, up to three pages. And if you attach the map, that would be the fourth. Um, and your narrative responses to the ranking evaluation, not the ranking criteria, the narrative ranking criteria, which is in section four of each of the guidelines. Um, and any other required attachments, do not attach anything other than what is required in the guidelines. Um, they will, it will not be reviewed. So uh, there are sample forms for these standard forms and the uh, available on our website where they have completed them as a demonstration to you on what information needs to go in your application at the time you submit it. Now, it's important to recognize when you are submitting in grants.gov that the AOR will receive a notification 
if the application transmits correctly. And if that does not happen, then you will want to reach out to the grants.gov help desk, not necessarily EPA, but the grants.gov help desk immediately to get assistance to make and make sure you have a case number. And that is critical. Get that case number because if there is a problem with your submittal, that is the information you'll be sharing with us to demonstrate that you had made a valiant attempt to get it submitted. Now, applications are not successful until they are submitted and validated. That's the word we're looking for, it, you're looking for in that email to your AOR by the deadline or they will be considered rejected. And that's again why we suggest you submit more than a day or two in advance because if there is a is a problem with your application, you will not get a validation email and you will have time to fix whatever the issue is. Again, as I mentioned, here, in addition to all those forms, you're going to be preparing a three-page, single-spaced narrative information, which we have very specific information we are asking you for. Do not include a cover letter with a summary of your project because that will be removed and will not be reviewed. Um, so be aware to follow the format. It must be on the organization that is applying's letterhead. Um, so don't submit as one organization or one part of your city and have it on a letterhead for a different department. Um, be sure it's on that organization's letterhead. And yes, we've had that happen. And we're asking for key information very specifically. You can find that in the guidelines in section 4C. There are some required attachments to some types of application, but all applications require you to add a threshold criteria attachment. And that is where you are going to address all the criteria identified in 3B of your guidelines. Do not skip any criteria. Do not assume that the information you've provided in the narrative de demonstrates that you are meeting all those criteria. Be specific, attach a threshold, documentation, document to your narrative information and narrative information sheet so that we can make sure that you are eligible. Um, I can't e emphasize that enough. We've had applicants who um, were cities who assumed they were eligible or had uh, and that they met all the criteria, but we really, it is a requirement that you provide it in a threshold attachment. And any relevant requirements, such as if you are a nonprofit, uh, 501c3 organization will be asking for the documentation of that. So again, Please read the requirements in the section three very carefully. Now your narrative page, and if you remember, I said the narrative evaluation information that's provided in section four is where you're gonna tell us the story about what you're going to do, tell us um, what you plan to, who you plan to serve, who you are engaged with, and how your project will move forward if you receive the funding. So there are page limitations to each of those. Pay attention. If you get to the end of page 10 and you're submitting a community-wide assessment grant and you have a paragraph that goes on to an additional page, that paragraph will be cut off and not provided to reviewers. So in that instance, it's unlikely you would be able to receive full points for whatever criterion it was that got cut off. Be sure to have a second set of eyes, review your fine application so you make sure there are no skipped pages and that you have not exceeded any of these page limitations. There is an application submission checklist in all of the guidelines. I recommend using that to make sure you have all of the information and nothing but the information that is required um, in your application before you submit it. Now, there are many, many, many resources available to you to help you in understanding the different grant types we've talked about and understanding what the requirements are for completing an application. It's a very competitive process, so I highly recommend um, you read the guidelines all the way through. 
and also look at the resources that are available to you. I keep mentioning headquarters and that is the Office of Brownfields and Land Revitalization. They have a Brownfields website that has a whole host of information, including information about this year's competition. There's a document called the FY25 Summary of Brownfields Guideline Changes, and there's also a Frequently Asked Questions document. I highly recommend, at minimum, you look through the Frequently Asked Questions document, as well as the assessment or cleanup or RLF guidelines in preparing your application. There are also some helpful information sheets about contracting, about planning, about other types of activities available on that website. There is a program called the Technical Assistance to Brownfields or TAB program that is funded by EPA, so it's free to you. Our region is covered by a program that's run out of the Kansas State University or KSU. That program has put together a very useful tool to help you write your actual applications. So if you go to www.tabeasy.org and select the Tab Easy e-tool, it will help you make sure you hit all the information that you need to understand and prepare for in submitting an application. You'll actually can write it right there and download the sections you need. And um, they have examples of, of past applications and they have side-by-side -side information regarding the, uh, the narrative evaluation criteria, the narrative ranking criteria and the evaluation criteria. I keep mixing those things up, but the one is the set of information you need to provide to us what we describe, you need to provide. And the second is the criterion that the reviewers will use in evaluating the information you provide. And it is very helpful, even if you don't use the Tab Easy tool, to uh, be looking at both sections as you are preparing your application. All right, that was a lot of clarification reminders. Do we have any outstanding questions that have not been answered? I see a question from Zabine Martin, where you were asking if this presentation recording be posted to the Region 7 website. The answer is yes, it will be posted. Um, I don't know how long that will take, but that is the intent of using this and the, all the other three presentations we will be doing will be posted there as well after they occur. All right, um, as I mentioned before, the next two of, uh, webinars that we do will cover the evaluation criteria in a little bit more detail and discuss that. Oh, and here's the answer to your question, Sabine, right here. Um, these recordings will be available and to at the link at this page, and the copy of today's presentation slides will be available there as well. If you have any... Yeah. Real quick, so sorry. Um, I do not know how long it will take for this to be... Um, uploaded, but could I take emails from those who would like it and I could email it to Certainly. them? Certainly. If you are interested in receiving the uh, slides for today, um, if you will email Tara and we'll, she's on my two slides from now, uh, we can get you that information and make sure you know um, when the recordings become available. And here she is, Tara Vaughn. And again, she's our Region 7 Brownfields Competition Coordinator and contact this year. You can also submit any questions you have to r7 underscore brownfields at epa.gov. And we will, um, Tara will receive those as well. So I want to remind you again, there's nothing that should stop you from asking threshold competition questions. If you are curious or if you aren't certain whether a site or the sites you're planning to address or the entities you're trying to partner with as um, coalitions are eligible, or if some part of one of your coalition members is a considered a instrumentality of your organization, those are questions you can ask in advance and we can respond to. And finally, I uh, just is a let you all know that we will be hosting a conference in August of next year, Brownfields 2025. Um, we hope that all of you will be able to attend. Um, it is possible for applicants who are successful and are um, 
selected to receive a grant to have pre-award costs to pay for this funding. Uh, and sometimes there are community scholarships available. So uh, mark it on your calendar and go to gobrownfields.org to see all the great information and all the great opportunities that these conferences provide. We'll be in Chicago this year, so it's not terribly far. And uh, I wanted to bring that to your attention. Now, last slide, are there any lingering questions? It doesn't look like it. Um, again, you can unmute if you have a question. And I am going to then say thank you for attending. We are excited to receive your applications. We hope you use all the resources available to you. And one that I didn't specifically mention was that both your state environmental authority and TAB the representatives of TAB are available to review your draft application. EPA cannot comment or review or talk to you about those narrative criteria that you're writing on, but they can. And I will tell you that a lot of the successful applicants have taken advantage of that review opportunity. So reach out to your state, reach out to TAB and let them know you're considering to apply and they will discuss with you the deadlines by which you must get drafts to them. And that's it for today. I'm going to turn off the record and say thank you for attending. And I hope to see you at our next two webinars.